right? In this video, we're going to look at carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, okay? One of the most important things to remember about C13 NMR is that we're ignoring most of the carbons. Uh, we take C13 spectra at natural abundance, and uh, at natural abundance, about 99% of our, our carbons are carbon-12s. Only about 1% are carbon-13s, and they're pretty much evenly distributed in nature. So at any molecule we look at, uh, we're looking at there being a 1% like a probability that the carbon that we're looking at is a C13, and thus uh, we're going to see an NMR signal for a C13, but not for a C12. Okay, since most of the carbons aren't absorbing, this presents a bit of a problem, right? Our signals are going to be very weak, much weaker than a proton signal for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons being that uh, C13 is a minor isotope. Okay, this is a has some important ramifications in the appearance of a C13 spectrum. Okay, so our signals are weak. So let's just look at this spectrum that you see right here that I'm circling here. Okay, um, we have a lot of noise. This noise is kind of random, but we have one little bit of the noise that looks a little bit bigger, so we might think that this is a peak. Okay, so one of the things that we can do is we can take the spectrum a multiple times and then just add them together. What happens here is that the noise is occurring in random places, whereas the peak is always occurring in the same place. And when you add them together, you get an enhancement in the signal to noise ratio. And the result is something like you would see here. The noise is random, but the signal is additive. Okay, this equation right down here sort of uh, tells us, gives us an idea of how long we need to acquire the spectra. So if we take multiple pulses or multiple scans, the, the signal to noise ratio is proportional to the square root of the uh, number of pulses or scans. If we take the spectrum 100 times, we can expect the uh, signal to noise ratio to increase by a factor of 10. Okay, uh, this is an important ramification for the appearance of a spectrum. Okay, so we're going to take the spectrum once, then we're going to take it again. But it takes carbon 13s uh, kind of a long time to relax back from the excited state to the ground state. So at the point where we take the second spectrum, a lot of times not all of the carbons have relaxed from the first spectrum. And this problem. Uh, it goes on with the third accumulation, the fourth, sorry, the fourth, third pulsar scan, the fourth pulsar scan, whatever. Uh, and this leads to an important, has an important ramification that integration is no longer a reliable method. We have to do something special to the spectrum uh, to actually get reliable integration. And uh, that usually adds a lot of. Uh, time to the acquisition, so it's not normally done. Okay, so here's some of the nuances that we're going to see when we look at a C13 spectrum. Okay, so we're not going to have reliable integrals anymore. We can't say that uh, we can't expect one carbon to always be one specific size. If uh, we have three equivalent carbons, uh, usually that peak is going to be bigger, but it's not quantitatively bigger. We can't really rely on the number that we get. The other issue is coupling. Okay, remember how protons coupled other protons in proton NMR. But since there's only one out of every hundred C carbons is a C13. This means that if we have uh, two carbons beside each other like this, the probability that both of those carbons are C13s is only one in 10,000 or uh, one one hundred squared. Okay, so we're not going to worry about C13s coupling to other C13s due to the low probability of uh, having two C13s in close proximity. Okay, 
The other issue we have is that the protons also, remember they have magnetic fields that can affect the carbon spectra, okay? So it turns out that if you look at a, let's say we're going to observe this carbon right here. Okay. And remember that as long as we have uh, three or fewer bonds, uh, we do have significant coupling. So that carbon that we're observing is coupled to that hydrogen, that hydrogen, and that hydrogen, much more strongly to this hydrogen than, than to these other two. But this is going to give the spectra a rather complex appearance. So what's commonly done with C13 spectra is to actually irradiate the proton spectra, which uh, basically evens out the ground and excited state pop population and the net effect is, is, is as if the car is if the hydrogens are not even there okay we call this process decoupling okay so c13 spectra are typically ran with a decoupling experiment okay most of the spectra that we see in this uh, section are going to be what we call broadband decoupled spectra in a broadband decoupled spectrum, the coupling to the hydrogen has been completely removed. All the peaks appear as singlets, and this is the far the most common, by far the most common type of spectra. It's the most quickly acquired uh, type of spectrum. Okay, if you want to get information about uh, how many hydrogens are attached to a carbon, there's a couple of other techniques we can do. You don't often, uh, they're not always done, but uh, if you need that information, you can get it through uh, an older technique called off-resonance decoupling, and this is where we partial uh, or irradiate the spectrum, but uh, kind of not in, in the right place. And, and this has the effect that we see only the really large one-bond couplings. Thus, the CH3 is going to be a quartet, the CH2 is a triplet, a CH is a doublet, and a quaternary carbon is going to be a singlet. Okay, another more modern uh, technique that's commonly used is, is called the uh, depth technique. Okay, sorry, I lost the cursor. And in this, uh, we actually hit it with a complex series of pulses. Uh, this class, we don't have enough time to explain the theory behind depth spectra, but the net appearance is, is that uh, as a result of this complex pulsing sequence, we're going to see CH3s and CHs appear as positive peaks that are singlets, and uh, CH2s are going to be negative, and quaternary carbons are going to uh, disappear. So we can compare the broadband decoupled spectrum with a depth spectrum and uh, get an idea for uh, the number of hydrogens attached to a uh, specific proton or a specific carbon of interest. Okay, our typical C13 spectrum uh, is going to use, just like proton spectra, we're going to use the same compound as a reference compound, tetramethylsilane, it's defined as zero, and the carbons in organic molecules uh, typically are going to come between zero and 220 parts per million. What we're going to see here is that um, the same things that affected proton spectra affect C13 spectra for, uh, for the most part, okay? Electronegativity has a big influence, as does hybridization. Okay, so if we look at sp3 carbons, uh, if the only thing they're attached to is hydrogen, another carbon, or bromine or iodine, we're going to see that they're going to come in this the lowest re region here, 0 to 50 parts per million. Okay, so if we look at this compound uh, here in propyl alcohol, what we see is that uh, this carbon that's not attached to the alcohol comes at 26, uh, and this carbon that is attached, that's uh, not a, also not attached to the alcohol and further away from the OH is 11, but both of them are in this 0 to 50 parts per million range. 
Okay, if the carbon is directly attached to fluorine, chlorine, nitrogen, or oxygen, uh, it's going to come somewhere between 40 and 90 ppm. And like before, uh, you have to keep an open mind. This is just where most of these come. Uh, and yeah, you have to keep an open mind for things coming slightly outside of this region. Okay, so uh, this compound here, three amino one propyl alcohol. Uh, let's just look at the two carbons that are on this that are attached to an electronegative atom. The carbon attached to oxygen comes at 61. The carbon attached to nitrogen comes at 40. Okay. All right. And uh, what you also see here is uh, oxygen is more electronegative than uh, nitrogen. So the one to oxygen generally have higher chemical shifts than the one attached to uh, carbon. Okay, we have this uh, periodic table effect where the further down in the periodic table you go, the lower the chemical shift. So it's only chlorine in the halogens that really uh, give it a slightly higher chemical shift. Uh, it, all the other halogens, bromine or iodine, don't really add to the chemical shift very much. Actually, iodine is, actually subtracts from the chemical shift. Okay. All right, so uh, an alkene, an sp2 carbon, is going to come 100 to 150. And you cannot distinguish an alkene sp2 carbon from an aromatic sp2 carbon. They're both in the same region. This is very different from the proton spectra, okay, where uh, the, where the uh, aromatic hydrogens came in a different place than the alkene hydrogens. Aromatics were at 7. Alkenes were around five. Okay. The other type of sp2 carbon we kindly we commonly encounter, a C double bond O, has a much higher chemical shift due to electronegativity. These are 160 to 220 parts per million. And the way the book we're using is organized uh, has some further refinements coming up for C double bond O's. We're going to see that uh, the type of functional group actually makes a big difference in the chemical shift. Uh, if it's a carboxylic acid, it's, it's sort of toward the low end here, whereas if it's an aldehyde, it's toward the uh, high end of the uh, 160 to 220 ppm range. Okay, we have an alkyne, uh, sp carbon. These are 60 to 100. Uh, in uh, this compound here, we see the uh, two alkyne carbons. They're not equal to each other, and they come at different places. And uh, nitrogen is a little more, bit more electronegative, so the sp carbon of a nitrile has a little bit higher chemical shift. Okay, all right. So let's look at some examples of some C13 spectra, and let's look at what we can tell from the uh, spectrum. Okay, this one is not going all the way to 220 parts per million because both of the structures we we don't really have any sp2 or SP carbon, so we know not to look there. All right, so let's look at the, the peaks that don't count first. Okay, in both of these spectra, you see right at 77 ppm, a three-line pattern. This is the peak for the most common NMR solvent, deuterated chloroform. Okay, when you decouple the hydrogens, you don't decouple the deuteriums, and uh, so they have a, a more complex pattern remains. Very often, some tetramethyl silane will be deliberately added so that you have a good reference peak, and uh, at zero we have TMS. So uh, we have to ignore that peak as well. All right, so if we look at in propyl alcohol, there are three distinctive protons. There's the three distinctive carbons. There's the one that's directly attached to the oxygen, one that's one away from the oxygen, and one that's two away from the oxygen. This is a broadband decoupled spectrum, so it appears as a, every peak is appearing as a singlet. Okay, so this carbon, that's the one that's directly attached to oxygen. That's right here. This carbon's here, and this carbon's here. It's uh, a little bit difficult to tell this, these two apart. There's a, 
more complex formula, and I prefer to leave that uh, individual chemical shift predictions to a more uh, advanced class. Uh, so we're just going to assume that all sp3 carbons that are not attached to an electronegative element are going to come somewhere between 0 and 50 or so ppm. All right, so this is isopropyl alcohol. Let me redraw it. And the thing to note here is that these two methyl groups are equivalent by symmetry. And uh, as a result, we only see two signals. Okay, so we see the signal for this carbon right here, and the signal for this carbon right here. Notice that the one uh, over to the right is a lot bigger. Uh, we can sort of say qualitatively that, that uh, that's consistent with two carbons giving rise to that signal, but it's not reliable. Notice up here where uh, we have three different carbons that the signals are not really all of the same size, and uh, this illustrates the unreliable of integration in broadband decoupled C13 spectra. Okay, uh, let's look at um, the difference between broadband decoupled, off resonance decoupled, and, and depth spectra. So up here we have the molecule camphor, which gives Vix Vapo Rub its uh, odor. And we have a unique carbon, uh, the C double bond O, occurring almost at 220 parts per million. Okay, but every other carbon is uh, attached only to a carbon or an oxygen, uh, sorry, a carbon or a hydrogen, and it's an sp3 carbon. So all of them, uh, one, of, one of them is above 50, but not, not much above 50. Uh, so it's a little bit out of range here. But all of these other carbons are coming in this region here, somewhere between about 8 or 9 and uh, 58. Okay. All right. So this is the spectrum here. And below it is the spectrum here. Uh, notice that there's a big area of the spectrum where there's nothing, right? So you can get more information if you just take this area here and expand it. And here you can see that this peak here that looks kind of like a thicker line is actually two peaks right here. Uh, and this gives us a better idea of the spectrum. So this is looking at uh, sp3 carbons only. Okay, so uh, here none of the carbons is uh, equal by symmetry and uh, we see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We see 10 peaks and uh, 10 signals. Okay, Here in the bottom we only see 9 signals because uh, the uh, one for the C double bond O is out of range. All right, so in the next spectrum we're going to do, we're going to just look at only the uh, sp3 region, but we're going to look at the off-resonance decoupled. And uh, remember that uh, in the off-resonance decoupled, uh, CH3s are quartets, CH2s are triplets, CH groups are doublets, and quaternary carbons are uh, singlets. Okay, so right here uh, we see that uh, 4 and 5 overlap so closely that the uh, triplet and doublet are kind of on top of each other, but here we see two clean triplets for 6 and 7, two partially overlapping quartets for 8 and 9, a clean quartet for 10, and tetramethylsilane has also become a quartet. All right, and this last one here, uh, this is the uh, depth spectrum of, uh, of camphor. And what we see here is that uh, CH and CH3 are positive uh, 
CH2 is negative and uh, quaternary carbons uh, do not have a peak in the uh, depth or in the depth spectrum is what it's called here. Uh, subtle difference, but we'll uh, but they basically mean the same thing. Okay, so here uh, notice that the ones that are either quartets or doublets uh, appear as positive peaks. Okay, uh, our one quaternary carbon for C3 up here, it's in the uh, off resonance decoupled spectrum, but it's not in the uh, depth spectrum. Okay. Yeah, so the peak that we see at uh, 45 or so isn't present. Uh, what is it, 46, something like that. All right, what else do we see? Uh, the CH2 groups for 6 and 7 and 4, they're all negative peaks down here. Most of the spectra that we're going to give you, in fact, virtually all the spectra that we would give you on uh, uh, homework, assignments and exams are, are just going to be the broadband decoupled spectra. All right, let's look at uh, how we can use C13 spectra to easily distinguish two compounds. Okay, so we have here para-bromobenzaldehyde versus uh, ortho-bromobenzaldehyde. The key here is symmetry. Okay, this one has a plane of symmetry. And uh, if we look at it, at the aromatic signals, these two are equal. These two are equal. This one here is unique. So um, we have the aldehyde signal. So this one we expect four signals here. Here there is no symmetry. And what we see here is that all seven carbons are not equal to each other, so we expect seven signals. So both of these have an aldehyde, okay, coming uh, slightly above 190 parts per million. Um, this looks, I believe this is actually a overlapping signal here. So if you look here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six uh, aromatics here. Whereas there's only four, four aromatic carbons there. All right, so thus we can probably uh, say with uh, a high degree of certainty that uh, this one is that spectrum and that this other one is uh, this spectrum just by counting the number of signals. And remember, don't look at the aldehyde because the aldehyde is common to both. That's not going to tell you uh, the difference between these two. You have to look at the benzene ring. Okay, all right, so the benzene ring is where they're different. Okay, so you can just tell by the number of signals. This next slide just tells you the answer. Okay, all right. So again, when we do these problems like this, the best way to do it is pause the video, do the problem yourself, and then uh, look as I go through the answer. Okay. All right, here's the next problem. Match spectra data, and one of them is presented as a spectrum, and in the other three it's just presented as a list of peaks. But uh, we're going to match the spectra with structures on the right side. And remember that we're going to ignore the three-line pattern at, that occurs at 77 parts per million because that's the solvent. And I didn't even bother to uh, include it in the listing of peaks at the bottom because it's just standard convention that you don't include that one. All right. Okay, so uh, how can we tell these two. Let's predict uh, for each of them 
the distribution of sp2 and sp3 carbon. So, okay, if you look at this one, it's monosubstituted benzene. There's a plane of symmetry right there. So we have this carbon that has the uh, propyl group is unique. These two orthos are the same. The two metas are the same, and the para is the same. So we expect four sp2 signals for this one. And for sp3, there's no symmetry on the side chain. So there's three. Okay, for this one, it's basically the same thing. It's uh, four. It's monosubstituted benzene ring, so it has the same symmetry and three signals. For C, four signals. Okay, just like uh, all the other monosubstituted benzene rings, the uh, one where the group's attached, the two orthos are the same, the two metas are the same, and the para is unique. However, here, these two methyl groups are equal to each other, so there's only two signals for the sp3 carbons. Okay, uh, the methyls are one signal, and the uh, CH group is the other signal. All right, and for this uh, last one, we can see a plane of symmetry here and a plane of symmetry here. And basically what we uh, see here is that uh, there's only two types of aromatic signals, the ones that are attached to ethyl groups and uh, all the others that just have a hydrogen are equal to each other. Okay, so there's only two aromatic or sp two carbons expected in this compound. And the two ethyl groups are equal to each other. Remember, we have a plane of symmetry going this way as well. So uh, there's only two types of sp3 carbons. OK, so we should be able to, OK, uh, A, B, C, and D. Right. So we should be able to tell C and D by just counting the number of peaks. All right, so here in this spectrum that's pictured, there's four sp2 carbons and two sp3 carbons. So uh, the spectrum that's pictured has to be C. Okay, and this last one we see, okay, sorry, there's some. Putting the pin way down there causes something to appear there. Sorry. So this is two and two. So this looks to be compound D. All right. So how are we going to tell A and B apart? Well, the only difference really is the oxygen. And uh, B has... Uh, SP3 carbon attached to O, whereas uh, this one has no uh, no SP3 carbons attached to O. So this one, uh, A, we're predicting that all of these SP3 carbons should have a chemical shift less than 50 or so, uh, or close to 50 at, at, at best. And in three, uh, or sorry, in B, we're predicting that one of these signals should be above 50 parts per million. Okay, so if you look at the listing of peaks here, there's that signal, the one that's above uh, 50 ppm. So this is B, and that's A. Okay? In spectrum A, we don't see, uh, amongst the sp3 carbons, we don't see any of them having a chemical shift of uh, 50 or higher. All right. Okay. So the next slide is just the answers uh, from what we saw before presented in a little bit neater of a fashion, in a, a somewhat neater presentation, rather. Okay, um, I'm going to end uh, the C13 one here, and in the next one we're going to talk about 
uh, all the other forms of spectroscopy, infrared, mass, and ultraviolet spectroscopy. We're going to find that, uh, let me just go back here. What's unique about both methods of NMR is that we try to account for every single signal in proton NMR and C13 NMR, whereas uh, we're going to leave a lot of the spectra for IR, UV, and mass spec uh, uninterpreted. Okay, so this video is going to stop here, and the next one will have the other spectral methods on it. Thank you.